Chaplin. My name is Chaplin Sai Ali, and I am the principal of this documentary, which is entitled Project Resurrection. And I discussed with my production crew that besides chronicling my life, this Project Resurrection, this documentary is about others as well, because I am not the only one who has suffered with PTSD and depression and have been a suicide attempt survivor. There are many individuals out there in the world that are waiting to have their story told. So one of the most important things of completing this documentary is showing the faces of others. And we are going to go across the board. We are going to speak with high school students back in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're gonna speak with military veterans who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. We are gonna talk with NYPD detectives who have survived 9-11. And we're gonna talk with my guest today, which is Miss Myrtle Edna Phillips McCurr. I pronounced it right? Uh, close. close. <laughs> I've been struggling with this last name even while we were talking off camera. But I met Miss Edna who is with His Grace Ministries and I'm remiss to thank Pastors Enrique and Eliana Cardenas for hosting this uh, session that we have today. His Grace Ministries International has been a godsend to me. I am a member of the congregation and I spoke uh, probably about a little over a month and a half ago uh, about Project Resurrection and about my own trials and tribulations. And Miss Edna, who is one of the church elders and the director of hospitality, heard what I had to say and she came back to me later and told me that it was an eye opener for her because she too has suffered with PTSD and depression and wanted to talk more about it because we discuss, I discuss personally the trigger points and a lot of people don't understand how to identify the trigger points. I wanna welcome you to this session and I thank you profusely for being able to talk about your own trials and tribulations because it sheds a light. It's not only me, it's not only military people, it can be citizens of this country who have gone through the things you have. And when you sent me your bio and your timeline, I was amazed of the things that you went through. Welcome. You were talking about the hip yes. and, and how that affected you as a, as a young child and the things that you had to do to kind of circumvent. It sounds like you didn't let it bother you a whole well, lot. I couldn't. I had parents that were kind of overprotective in some ways, and that didn't sit well with me because uh, I wanted to do everything like everybody else. But at the same time, they said, Edna, you can do and be anything that you want to be and encourage me to go do it. Yes. And boy, <laughs> sometimes I think they wish that they had never told me. They I should ask questions. I'm sure they do. <laughs> now, how long were you in Alabama? Um, my first eight years. Okay. Um, and then um, we lived through a series of traumatic events that affected my mother very badly. Um, she was indirectly hit by lightning when I was about four years old or so and almost died. And my sister and I thought she was dead and a great aunt who was living with us, she uh, brought her back. Um, God brought her back. She, did she resusc resuscitate her? Uh, um, she used like smelling salts okay. and cold. I don't know anything else, but, um, uh, and then later that year, our house was hit by a tornado with us in it and we survived. Um, it was actually the first house that I lived in there was a log cabin that my grandfather built when he homesteaded the property. And so it goes back a ways. Right. And then um, from there, we moved into the house with my grandmother. But um, as far as the hip thing goes, once it was discovered that I had the hip dysplasia, um, they decided to try to fix my hips with a series of plaster Paris casts over seven months. And um, once again, they couldn't keep me down. And I wore three of them out, right. pushing on a chair, trying to walk. You know, that's amazing. So, yeah, but they did their t the technology in those days wasn't such anywhere like it is now. Right. So they didn't realize that they should have put me in braces to keep them in the right position because they had made little sockets where they weren't supposed to be, but I was still able to walk. 
and able to do most things that any other kids could. I couldn't, I couldn't jump high. I couldn't sit uh, yoga fashion. And I think that was about it. I could do just about anything else anybody else could. So I never thought of um, myself as different, but at the same time, I thought there was something wrong with me when I heard my parents arguing and blaming each other. And they never knew that I knew that. They never knew. That was something you just kept tucked away? Yes. And I I tucked it away so well that uh, it was like um, I got older and I would get so far in life and and I get knocked back down again. I get up and get knocked back down again. I couldn't get past a certain point and I was determined to figure out why. And um, and I find a lot of money at uh, seminars and um, long events, sometimes a week, sometimes over the weekend, a long weekend, whatever. And that was when I remembered that conversation. And it be, that was when the healing started. Um, I was in my mid forties, I think, mid to, mid to late forties when uh, that discovery and it, that came back it, that episode of when my parents were arguing and blaming. And I thought at that point there was something terribly wrong with me. Now you, we talk about depression and I know that, uh, you had, as, as you were pregnant with your first son, Richard, Michael, um, you were telling me and in, in, in listen in a bio that you were suffering depression then during the pregnancy. Yes. What do you think brought on? What do you think the trigger point was for that first wave of, of depression? That uh, that trigger point was um, uh, we my um, the father of my child and I were very young, only 18 yeah, years, eight old. years old. And if we hadn't been a couple of kids with our hormones out of whack, <laughs> it would have never happened, right. you know? Right. Now, let me backtrack, too, because the, the doctor did tell you that you would not be able to give birth, correct? Right. He didn't say definitively that it was highly unlikely, unlikely correct. when I was 17 okay. that I wouldn't be able to get pregnant. So, <laughs> sif up her lip, I'll, I'll be a career woman, okay? My sister will have the kids. Well, she never did, and God gave me four. Four boys. Four wonderful, healthy sons. And 12 grandchildren. And another one on the way. And went on the way. Yeah. So um, you proved the doctors wrong. Absolutely. And this is going to be a series of things where you have proven science and, and things wrong because you had several hip surgeries, correct? I've had um, a total of eight surgeries, six on the left hip, two on the right hip, and a knee surgery. And, yes, on, on the knees as well. Yeah. Well, I, my knee started dislocating because I became the overachieving little girl uh, um, and the winning jump at hopscotch when I was 10 years old, the left knee dislocated on me. Very, very painful, scared the heck out of everybody else. And they really got grossed out when I slowly moved my knee, my leg forward and it popped back in. Right. <laughs> but that didn't keep it from popping back out again and again and again. And so... Um, the doctor told my folks because there wasn't technology available other than x-rays and the problems didn't show up on the x-rays, although it was very big and fat and swollen and red and hot and crackly. And because he couldn't figure out what was wrong, he told my folks I was faking to get attention. Wow. And I didn't need to fake to get attention. I was president of my class. Well, you certainly (laughs) didn't need attention. No, and I I was an A student, you know. So back to uh, when you got pregnant with your first child, how, so the depression set in. Yes. How did you handle that? Now you're 18 years old Mm -hmm. and you're, you got a child on the way after you were told that it was highly unlikely. How did you handle, and this comes in waves. How did you handle that first wave? Were you able to get counseling back then? Because this was was a while ago. But it wasn't until I tried to kill myself. Okay. And, um, um, and, it, and, it, and it was because like the father of my child, he didn't want to be married and he didn't want the responsibility. He wanted the fun of making that baby, right. but, of course. You know, and, but it's that way with so many people. And it's like, I didn't know what to do. My mom had very strict upbringing had told us girls, if you ever get in trouble, you're no longer a daughter of mine. Well, my sister and I didn't know what that meant, but I sure did once I got pregnant. 
And so it was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? He doesn't want me. They aren't going to want me, you know? And so these feelings of abandonment, these feelings of less than, of not being worthy. And I could not even identify what those feelings were in those days. I just felt them. And the depression set in and I just kind of sat blank most of the time until I just decided I'm going to end this. And I didn't even think about I was going to hurt my baby. I, that wasn't even there. I would have never in this world want to hurt a child. So let's, if you don't mind, let's talk about the suicide attempt. How, what did you, what was your mindset? What were, how was the plan going to be hatched out? What were you thinking? Um, I just took a whole lot of, of pills of aspirin and whatever, a, a feeble attempt. Yeah. You know, I didn't know that it was really dumb. And, and also I did it because I wanted to hurt my child's father because he didn't want me. It was like, I'll teach him a lesson. And, and after that, the roommate where we were living, we shared like a flat, um, wonderful young man from Puerto Rico. He ended up being uh, my um, uh, husband's best man. We did get married after that. Um, and it, it was not a good marriage. Um, uh, but tried to make the best of it for 23 years. So you were married 23 years. 23 uh, four, years. Four boys. Four sons. What, now taking the aspirins, what kind of effect did that have on you? Uh, made me pretty sick. Okay. You know, I never did that again. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was it for the suicide attempts. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, as we go further, I mean, and, and here's the thing, and we, we talked about this off camera. I don't think that we ever surpass or get past post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. I think there's always that little nugget that's on the periphery. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think knowing that it's there, and you may feel different about this, but I, you, when, when I first wrote the article entitled Out of the Storm, I shared it with clergy members of my, in my family circle. And one pastor who's a Presbyterian minister in Cleveland, Ohio, read the article. One of the first ones to read it and said, your story's not over, is it? No. And I thought about it, and I was like, well, I guess it isn't. Mm -hmm. This will be a battle. However, I'm controlling the battle. Yes. You feel you feel that's applicable to you? I think it is, because um, it, what's done is done, and what's there is there. But we gain tools to be able to live our lives successfully and to be blessings to others in the process. It, the healing is an ongoing process. Yeah. It is. Just it like is. life itself. Yes, it is. So you had four kids. How how was your career? How did you manage that? Well, you found you found Christ early on in your age because your grandfather was a Baptist yes. minister. Yes. Your mom played piano yep. in church. So you basically grew up yes. in a church environment. I was blessed. Yes. Yeah. Do you think your faith carried you through these series of events without a shadow of yes, a doubt yeah. beyond right. a shadow of a doubt and it's only grown because i've watched god be in the mix every single step of the way every single step that something awful happened to me it's like god it says oh yeah let me show you what i'm gonna do and the blessings continue and continue and continue. And I cannot possibly be so blessed without giving it away, whether it's talking here today or in other ways. So uh, that's my mission in life is to empower other people so that they can live and empower more people. And the more that we are empowered, the greater it all becomes. Right. Now, you had ductal uh, carcinoma is a yes, ductal carcinoma. Yes. Is that a form of cancer? Yes. Yes. And so you you survived. You made it through that. <laughs> it was spontaneous, miraculous healing <laughs> at a New Age seminar. <laughs> God shows up any place. <laughs> the, and the tumor, the meningio meningioma. Meningioma. Uh, the tumor, tumor of the left side of your brain. On the lining of my brain. 
the reason it's called a meningioma is the lining of our brains is called a meninges. Right. And so uh, the geoma was uh, the um, whatever carcinoma right. on the lining of yeah. the brain, but it wasn't um, uh, cancerous. Okay. But um, the way I came to know His Grace Ministries International, um, and they weren't there at that time, but Pastor Enrique, and he wasn't a pastor then, came with my son, Sean, and another uh, brother, Rusty, whom you've not met yet, an okay. awesome, awesome man. Right. Um, and they laid hands on me, anointed me with oil, and prayed. And, it, and that was 2006, 16 years ago, never another problem. And the same thing with the meningioma. Um, I came back and I knew that um, I had to, and I knew that I was healed the moment that I was healed. Um, and um, there had been unforgiveness and I had even been mad at God. And I think that we all, those of us who are affected disproportionately with this kind of thing in our lives, and I call it a thing because I don't look at it as a disease. It's there to try to steal us. I think it's just part of what the adversary in this world uses to try to take us all out. And, and folks who may be listening to this, it's real. There is spiritual warfare here. There, there is. There is. But you, you know, we were talking in church. You know, we had a series of, of pastors that sermons about wearing the armor. Yes. Uh, you've definitely worn. Yes. You got the armor. Yeah. It's because the armor is Jesus. Right. He's the only living God. And if we don't have him in our lives, we don't have anything. We don't have anything to stand on. We have no foundation to start. And um, with all that he has given me, all that God has given me, I have to give homage. I have to give honor to Jesus yes. because I would not be here today. I wouldn't have made it for 75 years in this life. And I feel right now my life is just beginning again. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Well, I had a great, great, great grandfather who lived to be 112 years old. I don't know if I'll live that long. So you're just a youngin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're young. And I love that. Now, as you went on through life, how was the family life? Because uh, you were married the first time was 23 years. Yes. What happened towards the end of that and how did that affect you? Well, my, um, my husband had a major problem with drugs and alcohol and still does. Um, he, he'll be 76 next month. Um, this was your first husband. My right? first okay. husband, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, for a while, I did drugs and alcohol along with him, like in a social level. Um, I needed to fit in, and it was not a good decision to make. Um, and it's not one that I'm proud of, but it's also not something I'm going to hide because that would be living a lie, and I refuse to do that. You're transparent. I, Very I have transparent. to be, and I, I appreciate that. Because we need transparency in this journey. If we don't, I don't think we can help others. I don't think we're serving them no. as we should. And people who really are in the know, and particularly if they have the spirit of Christ living in them, they're going to know anyway. Just like a little kid knows when somebody's um, given them a, a line. Yes. Yeah. So how, how did your marriage dissolve, the first one? Um, he was very emotionally, mentally... Uh, um, uh, abusive uh, when he was drinking and his favorite thing was to put me down in front of other people which just crushed me until finally so it was um, emotional and verbal abuse. yes emotional and verbal did it ever get physical no okay one time okay. i thought he was going to hit me and that was when i was sitting on the edge of the bed just out of a shower and i said to him we need help and he became so angry, he lifted his fist in the air like he was going to hit me and growled and came down and hit the mattress okay. instead. Okay. And I didn't flinch because I, I, I just intuitively knew I better right. not. Sure. But um, he never became physically violent other than it seemed that he would at right. that time. Right. And, um, and I grew to hate him. I, uh, the hatred that I had inside me, I ended up with feelings and nightmares right. of how to kill him. And I'm not a violent person. And that's when I went and started getting counseling. Gotcha. 
And I was in and out of doctor's offices with all kinds of maladies. Right. And finally, the doctor says to me, the nurse practitioner one day, how is your life at home? And I just burst into tears. That was the floodgates. Huh? Yeah, the floodgates opened. Yeah. And she's the one who put me in touch with resources to be able to help me. Right. And uh, finally, through the Women's Crisis Center, I um, got a restraining order, and then I got a divorce. Okay. And, and that was it as far as that. But it, it didn't end there. <laughs> How were your sons and your sons, Richard, Nicholas, Sean, and Benjamin, how were they affected by what was going on at home? Well, I think that they're still affected okay. because um, the, with the child um, uh, visitation and everything, and I wasn't trying to keep their father from seeing them. Right. Uh, I was trying to protect them. Sure. Uh, and and even in that, it was have have supervised visitation. Right. Oh no, I don't need that. I'm not doing anything wrong. I didn't abuse you. Uh, because in his redneck upbringing, abuse meant that you were beating your wife. Right. Well, abuse comes in many forms. It sure does. Unfortunately. Yes. But um, um, it was, we were not supposed to speak badly of the other in front of the children. Right. And when uh, that was there, um, and they asked if anything could go wrong with this agreement, what would that be? Right. I didn't want to speak what um, I did, but mm. she said, you need to be honest. I right. said, it's that he's going to continue to talk badly about me. And it was horrible things right. that was abusive to a child. Because even if they had been true, it's slapping a child in the face when you talk badly like right. that to the child. Sure. And it was always, your mother flushed our family down the toilet. Your mother is out blanking around if you're there. I'm not going to see you as often as mm. I could because your mother, your mother, your mother. Right. And she's the blank, the whore of Froomdale. She's right. this, she's that. And none of those things were true. Yeah. But if you can't accept responsibility for your drugging and drinking and your abusive behavior, right. if you always blame somebody else, you never have to yes, be responsible. Now, in April of 2002, I see in your timeline that you were diagnosed with PTSD. Yes. Where, how, how, do, how did that manifest? That was it because of the marriage? And no, the, things the that marriage were... had dissolved. Okay, by then. Um, okay. Um, let's see. The marriage dissolved in 1988 or 89. Okay, 89. okay. Um, and um, that came about um, because I had been the director of the Franciscan Workers of Junipero Serra. Okay. It's a multi-unit 501c3 corporation ministry okay. that oversees programs for homeless and marginalized people. Gotcha. And also at marginalized, we had programs at the farm labor camps down in Soledad and Gonzales okay. with after school programs for the children. Gotcha. Well, there had been a real upheaval um, with one of the founders had had an affair with one of the young uh, staff members and blamed his wife and everything fell apart. I was the only remaining staff member that didn't either leave in disgust or uh, didn't get ran off by him. Okay. And so I suffered tremendous adversity holding on and keeping things together there until finally I went out on a leave of stress. Um, that was in December, but I officially resigned in April. Okay. Um, and um, the... and. I had a year to uh, with counseling and um, a year of just being able to chill out, so to speak. With, decompress? Yeah, to decompress. Yeah. yeah. And uh, But that's how that all came about. Oh. And during that time, uh, the um, counselor that I was seeing um, in conjunction with my doctor said PTSD because she asked me, what, uh, similar to what you asked me for right. with the bio info, sure. can you give me some background information? And I came in after she'd read it and she says, you're amazing. You're This is incredible. You're amazing. And I'm going, what? Because for me, I only did what I had to do. You know, right. I picked myself up each time, dusted myself off and kept on going. Sure. I didn't have time right. 
to sit and cry in my beer and I don't drink. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And I had three youngsters because my eldest son was 12 years older. He was like 22 when the marriage broke up. And even he thought that I was crazy. Right. Even he thought that, that um, I was out there because he had grown up with that abuse in his life right. and didn't know that his mother was being abused. So, excuse the pause there, but so you were diagnosed with depression at an early age. Yes. And it manifested into 2002. You, and I think I'll ask, I may have asked this in another way. Do you think you've always had it? Or do you think it was just the trigger points and the things that happened in your life that maybe yes. recirculated yes. and got yes. that going? Yeah. Each time um, I, I would, I, I have this indomitable pioneering spirit in me. I think probably from my ancestors coming um, like, uh, one of my ancestors, it was traced all the way back to the 1630s with Elder Winthrop and right. the Puritans, not the Pilgrims, okay. coming over from um, the Wales. Mm -hmm. And that was Reverend George Phillips. Okay. And, um, and he's on the ship's log. Also, history goes all the way back to that point. Right. And then my mom's family came through with the German migration mm -hmm. around the end of the um, 19th century. Sure. And they were interred on uh, a nice word for imprisoned mm -hmm. on Ellis Island. Right. And one of the kids was born there. Yeah. And so I've got that. And then the pioneering coming across country um, by uh, mule train, right. wagon train. Yes. Yes. Um, it's incredible what my ancestors survived and thrived and they thrived because they banded together like we're supposed to we're told in god's word that lived the golden rule and they did so you think the lineage of your ancestors has helped strengthen you it sounds yes. like there's a lot of resolve in the lineage of yes. the family yes it, um it, i mean I never saw anybody crying and, and feeling sorry for themselves. Right, right. My mom, some after she was hit by lightning and everything, because right. it affected her mentally. Right. Um, I remember my mom being much happier and the pictures of her before that happened and the yes. ones later. And there she was somber and really depressed. Mm -hmm. And so there was a very, very big difference. Right. But uh, other than that, um, we were a joyful family. Yeah, my dad with his harmonica and yes. dancing while mom played the piano and we you all sang. A musical family. Yes. How about your second marriage? Second marriage. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, I met Scott. Um, that would be, uh, we were married in November of 2013, almost nine years ago now. Um, and I met him four years before we were married. And then we served in ministries together at a little church in Prunedale. Right. And, um, and he struck me as someone who was a godly man, um, upright, ready to help anybody and everybody. And I had no hint uh, that there was mental illness there because he hid it really well. And uh, he was also, with meds, very able to maintain uh, uh, an equilibrium in his life and work and serve. When did you find out that he had, uh, he was diagnosed as bipolar? Is that um, after we were married. How, how much, how long? Um, in the first week. Oh, so you <laughs> found out relatively quick. Yeah, but I didn't know what to do with it. it it's like, I'm from the old school, and I also believe what the, that God asks us to do, that, that you, you're married. You do everything to make it work. Right. And I did. But he had other ideas. And um, I'm not going to diss him, as my kids might say. Right. I'm not going to be disrespectful. Sure. Um, because I don't know if it was deliberate or not. Right. But um, shortly afterwards, he asked me if I would help him get off of his meds. And I had no idea what I was getting into, um, but I've learned since that most people who are bipolar, that they don't realize how uh, extreme that those extremes are Absolutely. and how negatively it affects everyone around them. Right. So um, I, I, I knew from my brother had um, taken psych, uh, psychiatric meds, and that's another story entirely. Right. 
And my brother would do things of just stopping taking them so that he would have psychotic episodes right. so that he could continue to draw money. That was my sure. brother. Sure. And I don't, Scott wasn't that way. Mm -hmm. Scott liked to work and he liked to do things with right. his hands. And that was how he showed his love. Right. But it, it, he just rejected me as a wife. And, and that was the constant rejection over and over and over and over again. But he wanted, he had this facade that in public, his arm around me and we were the perfect couple. Right. And, and I was just uh, inside. And at the same time, I didn't want to let people think badly about my right. husband. So I went along with it. And, so, and you were married eight years. Eight years. Eight years you went through that. Eight years. And um, he, uh, and then finally when he left a year ago without even saying anything, a literal abandonment, I was more disabled than I am now. I could only walk with the walker right. and I barely could get around with that because rejection uh, and, and no physical touch, um, it impairs a person. It's like babies uh, who are in an orphanage that are only held when it's necessary. Right. You, know, you don't thrive. And I didn't thrive in our marriage. So how did the marriage end? Um, he left um, uh, totally unexpectedly. I learned later that he had been doing drugs because I found evidence of a stash in my car. And... Um, um, and other people that he was with that he shouldn't have been with and right. like living a double life. It, I, I call it a double agent, right. you know, on, on, in one hand, uh, this godly man leading men's breakfast and doing this and preaching down at um, Victory Mission and I led the worship and, but on the other hand, it, um, it, the demons, it, yeah, yeah, demons, yes, quite literally. And I and there were good times, right? But the the roller coaster of the bad times far outweighed the good. Yeah. And still, I was trying to stick in there. Still, yeah. we were in marriage counseling, right. and I guess it, there was something that snapped in him, and he just took off one night, and I didn't even know he was gone during the COVID thing. And I was on the phone with one of my sons that both him and his daughter had been with COVID. And the next day I found that 12 members of my family had COVID. COVID and yeah. all of a sudden I've got this abandonment issue. I've got, how am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to make the car payments? How, 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 right. how? Right. And then he emptied the bank accounts and he did put that back, borrowed the money on okay. a credit card. Okay. You know? And then I'm looking at all these things that he's doing with credit cards and buying cars and lying to people. It was all fraud uh, to get by. Right. But when you've learned to do those kinds of things and you, your focus is only on you and not on the other person or really honestly on other people, then it just changes everything. Now, you told me off camera that the community really stepped up on your behalf. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I, 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 I don't, there aren't words enough to express the gratitude in my heart. Um, I had a friend approach me less than a week later. Our businesses have thrived this year and uh, we want to pay half of your rent for the next six months, and they did for yeah. seven. Um, uh, I want to help you here. I'm going to pay for this. I'm going to pay for that. I'm, and my even the manager of where I live, Edna, there's a program that I think might be able to help you. Well, they couldn't because it was about COVID, and so I didn't qualify. Right. But I think that maybe God didn't allow that because he wanted me to see beyond a shadow of a doubt that he wasn't going to let me fall right. through the cracks. Yes. And he didn't. Yeah. He didn't. And we talked about that. You and I both talked about that because sometimes we think less of ourselves than God actually thinks of us. Fortunately. Yeah. Fortunately for me and fortunately for you that we're wearing that armor. Yes. And that pulls us through, even yes. though we don't think sometimes, I didn't think I was going to pull through. Yeah. But yet, by his grace, I'm here. By his grace, I am too. And you're here. 
by his grace and only by his grace. And we get to share the story. Yes. What would you, if this documentary makes it onto a worldwide platform or stage, what would you, Miss Etna, tell folks out there? Never stop believing. Never doubt that Jesus is real. Never doubt that he is the only true living God that there are other religions out there, and I'm not disrespecting anyone and their choices because everyone has a choice. But if you can choose the real, why not choose the real? Because he has shown me in every possible way. He saved my life over and over and over and over again. Absolutely. He's brought me through trial and tribulation after trial and tribulation. He's He's healed me of breast cancer. He's healed me of the, the, the tumor on the lining of my brain. Uh, Pastor Enrique and, and Rusty and my son, the three that came and prayed for me when I was right. healed of the meningioma, they came and I'd had COVID and it was really bad. And, but I went to the hospital and the doctor was honest with me. And he says, I have nothing that I can offer you that's going to help you. Ms. Edna, I want to thank you for at least spending this time this Sunday afternoon. Because uh, your words are going to matter. I hope so. They're going to matter because my words mattered to you. And my words yes. matter to others. So your words will matter yes, to your, others. Yes, your words, your testimony that day it was another aha moment in my life of, okay, I've got triggers and my core issue is about, am I worth anything? Right. right. And th with Scott, it, I was constantly told, not by him, his words, but by his actions, you aren't worth anything, right. you're worthless. Right. And then to, for him to finally leave and do what he did is you aren't worth anything, I'm gonna crush you into the ground. Well, God but he says, didn't. Uh, no, and I don't think that that was his intent. Right. But it was Satan's intent, the adversary's intent, using him. And we can either be a tool for the enemy or we can be a tool for good. It's our choice every single day of our life. And we plant the seeds. I hope so. Thanks, Miss Ed. You're welcome. Appreciate you. God bless you. God bless you.